Uh, we have a, a, a very special uh, program for you this evening. And not one, but uh, three very fine uh, authors, all journalists, all seasoned, intrepid war reporters. Uh, they've written memoirs and are here to discuss their experiences in, in uh, Afghanistan, Syria, and other conflict zones. Uh, first, at the, um, the, at the uh, far, my far right is uh, Janine uh, Giovanni, a Newsweek's Middle East uh, editor and a contributing editor at, at Vanity Fair. Uh, at the start of her journalistic career, Janine covered the first Palestinian intifada in the late 1990s. Since then, in the 1980s, I had 1980 <laughs> Um, since then, she's reported on turmoil and civil conflicts throughout the Middle East uh, and beyond. Uh, in her latest book, The Morning They Came For Us, she chronicles the war in Syria. And using seven different perspectives, she provides a vivid picture of a ravaged nation as experienced by its citizens. Among them, a nun, a doctor, a musician, and a student. Their stories convey the realities of modern urban warfare from the pervasive smoke to the hunger, to the return of such previously vanquished diseases as typhus and polio. Uh, next to Janine is Christina Lamb, currently the chief foreign correspondent for the Sunday Times. Uh, like Janine, Christina's introduction to conflict reporting also came in the late 1980s, uh, but in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan. Her journalism uh, has since taken her far and wide, including assignments in Brazil, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Iraq. Uh, but since the 9-11 the attacks, uh, she's spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time uh, in, Af in Afghanistan. Uh, she wrote I Am Malala, or co-wrote I Am Malala with uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner Malala from Southside. And her new book, Farewell Kabul, highlights the errors and miscalculations made by the United States and his allies in the war in Afghanistan. Uh, and, um, and argues uh, that the world has been left more, not less, dangerous since 9-11. Our third author is uh, Kim Barker, whose book, The Taliban Shuffle, uh, about her reporting in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, served as the basis for the recent movie, A, Wisco, A Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, <laughs> starring <laughs> Tina Fey. Uh, Kim's first reporting jobs were with papers in Indiana and Washington State. Um, after joining the Chicago Tribune in 2001, she ended up going abroad and spent five years from 2004 to 2009 as the Trib South Asia Bureau Chief based in New Delhi and Islamabad. She now writes for the New York Times. A Times review of, of her book called it both hilarious and harrowing two contrasting adje adjectives that also sum up the frequently mixed experience of war reporting. Moderating discussion by, by this impressive group of uh, panelists <coughs> will be Mary Jordan, uh, herself a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist with the Washington Post. Mary was based abroad for, for 14 years in Tokyo, Mexico City, and London, and she's currently covering the, the presidential campaign. <laughs> she told me as we were walking in that she just interviewed Donald Trump today. So you know, um, anyway, we're sort of getting off track. Right? Uh, Mary's the most recent book, uh, which she co wrote with her husband, uh, Kevin Sullivan, also in the Washington Post. Uh, is titled Hope, a Memoir of Survival in Cleveland, and chronicle of the kidnapping and torment of two of the women held captive in a home in Cleveland by uh, Ariel <coughs> Castro. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panel. Of our time, the former head of the New York Foundation, uh, 
journalists. And it's a testament to, is this working? Yeah, it's working. Um, it's a testament to all the work that you've done. Uh, it's, I'm very proud to be up here on the stage. So I want to ask you first, before we get into um, other things, how did this happen? You know, other kids grow up and they want to be, they want to run Facebook. Um, <laughs> why did you want to go to war? You want to start? Yeah, um, well, I, I never wanted to be a journalist. I was an academic, um, and I was doing my master's degree when, in comparative literature, in Russian and French literature, so completely different. And I wanted to be a professor and write novels, possibly, and write literary criticism. And one day, I saw a photograph of um, an Israeli soldier burying a Palestinian teenager alive with a bulldozer of sand. And the article was about a human rights lawyer called Felicia Leiber, who um, was a Jewish Holocaust survivor, who was one of the few Israeli lawyers then defending Palestinians in military court. And it was Providence. I flew to Israel, I met her, she took me under her wing, and I feel like I went through a door that never, I, I could never go back again. And I basically couldn't finish my PhD. I, um, I, she said to me, if you have the ability to give a voice to people that do not have a voice, then you have an obligation. And I was just haunted by injustice and that I could, as a journalist, have some kind of impact on uh, doing this. And then the war in Bosnia came, and that was a whole other, that opened a whole other scenario for my career. We're going to go back to getting the book about that. But Christina, so did you grow up knowing that you were going to end up doing 28 years? 28 years she's been in away. Yes, giving away how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite amazing. No, I mean, I also never set out to be a war correspondent. I, um, I always wanted to write. I love writing. I wanted to have adventures. Um, but basically, I became a war correspondent as a result of an invitation to a wedding. And what happened was, um, I started, after I left the university, I worked as an intern at the Financial Times in London. Um, one day, the foreign editor was supposed to be going to a lunch of South Asian politicians, and last minute he couldn't go. And he said to me, you're always going on about India, why don't you go to this lunch? So I went to the lunch, sat next to somebody who was Secretary General for the Pakistan People's Party, which was Benazir Bhutto's party. And he asked me if I'd like to interview Benazir, who was living in London in exile at the time. So of course I said yes. And the day that I went to interview her was the day that she announced her engagement to Asif Ali Zadari. So the apartment was full of bouquets of flowers. Um, and we got on very well. She was very good at charming foreign correspondents, particularly men, I think. But uh, she then went back to Pakistan. I went to work as a trainee for a, a British regional TV company, where I was the most junior person and was doing kind of flower shows and things like that. And one day I came home from work, and there was this absolutely beautiful gold inscribed invitation on my doormat, and it was to Benazir's wedding in Pakistan. So of course I went, and I, it was just the most amazing introduction to Pakistan. It was like something out of Arabian Nights. I mean, if you've ever been to a South Asian wedding, if they go on for a very long time, and they're very colourful. And each evening after the ceremonial events, there were discussions about how to take on Pakistan's military dictator, Jamazia. And all of her colleagues were people who had been tear gassed and tortured and imprisoned. And the most dangerous thing I'd ever had to deal with was finding my way home after missing the last train in London. So I was fascinated. So I came back to London and said, I'm going to go and live in Pakistan. And everybody I went to talk to, all of the foreign editors said, we're not interested in Pakistan. General Zia has been there for years. Nothing's going to change. But we are interested in Afghanistan because the Russians are there. So why don't you go and cover that? So being 21 at the time, I agree. And the last story I ever did for British television was a man who turned his car back to front so it looked like it was going forwards when it was going backwards. I don't think I was a great loss to British uh, TV. So it was a wedding. So we'll go back to the Israelis. You then went on to many other places. But Kim, tell us how you... Your story is equally 
different from these two about how you got in? Well, I always knew I wanted to be a journalist. Um, ever since I took a journalism class when I was a sophomore in Laramie, Wyoming, and I thought, what a great con. You know, the whole idea that I could get out of class and like pull my friends out of class and ask questions and write about it. It just seemed like the greatest job in the world. Um, so I never thought about being a foreign correspondent though. I was very, I, we didn't travel anywhere. Um, my parents, I grew up not the richest person in the world and we never even went to Canada or Mexico growing up. We always stayed local to Wyoming and Montana. So after 9-11 happened though, I was in the Chicago Tribune and there were other people who were volunteering to go, and you would see like these desks sort of empty out, and you know, this person would go try it. And I kind of felt like, not that I wanted to be a war correspondent, but that I wanted to see if I could cover the biggest story in the world. Um, and I didn't know that I would end up falling in love with it and end up staying for so long. Um, but I did, uh, I did um, actually volunteer for, the, for going overseas when I heard that they were gonna try to send some more women overseas because uh, we hadn't tried out a lot of women. I think at one point, um, I, I went out with a female friend, and we both wanted to go cover 9-11, cover everything, and we counted the number of men that had been sent out, and like the number of women, and it was like 17 men and one woman. <laughs> so I wanted to also prove that a woman could do it. Um, so I was trying to figure out how I could distinguish myself from the other female reporters that might volunteer when I heard that they were looking to send more women overseas. And, uh, I don't speak any foreign languages. I hadn't even been to Europe. Uh, but I went in with the biggest argument I had, which was um, I introduced myself and I said, hello, I'm Kim Barker. I'm a Metro reporter. I'm single and I'm childless and therefore I'm ex expendable. <laughs> <laughs> I did say that. Um, he laughed and I said, I'll go anywhere you want to send me. Send me. And he was just like, get ready to go to Pakistan. And I called my parents after that and said, I'm going to Pakistan. And they said, what? No, no, you're not. Why on earth would anybody send you to Pakistan? Um, turns out they were wrong. So, and then I went four months later. <laughs> um, when I got posted first to Tokyo, I called my mother, and it was a big deal. I mean, at the time, in the 90s, it was, and my mom goes, oh no, what did you do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Let me read you uh, something that Kim wrote in her book, and you'll get a flavor for um, how she writes. Afghanistan felt more like home than anywhere else in the region. I knew why. Afghanistan sounded, seemed familiar. It had jagged blue and purple mountains, big skies, and bearded men in pickup trucks stocked with guns <laughs> and even for the government. <laughs> it was like Montana. <laughs> Because you, you know, through humor, it was like you could picture you 
there. Uh, and yet you were giving us so much information, and I think that's why the reviews have been through the roof about the book, so congratulations. Of course, the movie that was just made, so I have to ask, so what's Tina Fey like? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> serious. <laughs> I think I'm actually funnier. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, Tina. Um, no, uh, Tina is really incredibly generous. I didn't spend a lot of time with her before um, they ended up filming the movie because I think there are two kinds of actors, the ones who like to spend a lot of time with somebody and sort of inhabit them, and then the ones that like to take a character and make it their own, almost like you don't want to spend any time with that person. So I, we just had a, a long lunch, which I just remember complaining about high heels, really. I mean, we complained a lot about high heels, and then she told me a story that I told was really funny. And I was proud of myself, and I, for the life of me, couldn't remember what the story was. So I told something that made Tina Fey laugh, and I don't know what it was. Um, and then, like, you know, when I was on set, she was really kind to me. She, um, and, and during the whole process, it, every single time that she was on a late night show, she would mention my name and my book, the original title, by name. And so I think my publisher was thinking that the movie tie-in that's got her face on the cover and it's called Whiskey Tango Foxtrot would end up eclipsing the Taliban shuffle because of the movie, but because she mentioned it so much, the Taliban shuffle started selling out all the time on Amazon. Um, so I can't say enough nice things about her. She's just been incredibly generous to me. She's a very much a supporter of women, and I, I really benefited from that. Well, let's go back. You know, there's, it used to be that there were not that many more correspondents that were female. Uh, but right now, the Washington Post actually has quite a few, um, and a lot of other people do too. And uh, Lisa Rubin just won the, uh, the Pulitzer for the New York Times covering Afghan women. But it's, it is very different, isn't it? Let's go, we'll start with Janine and just talk about how being a woman in a war zone affects your reporting. Well, when I started 25 years ago, um, there were very, very few women. And the women that were in the field, in my case in the Middle East, weren't very friendly to other women. I think it was because it was so competitive, it was so male, it was so driven, that there was a great sense of, of competition. Um, I think now it, it's radically changed, but I do think, I've been asked this question um, over and over again, do men and women report in different ways? And I think it's very individual, because um, what I do, I'm a human rights reporter, I go into the field, I spend a long time with people or on a certain story, I don't, I'm a terrible scoop reporter or sensationalized reporter. I, I, I'm not good at going and getting, you know, the, finding the mother of the last Brit in Sierra Leone or something like that, but I need to spend a long time. And I think that, um, we were talking earlier about the war in Bosnia. Bosnia was the, water, the watershed moment that changed reporting in our, um, in our generation, I think. It was basically our generation's Vietnam. And it was the time when a small group of us were very, very committed to affecting policy. And we felt that we were not going to let this genocide happen on our watch. And we stuck it out. We lived in Sarajevo during the siege with the people. We were sniped, we were shelled, we were starved, we, were, uh, we didn't have food, we didn't have water. But yet we, we did something that I'm very proud of. And I feel like everyone that was in that war and covered that war feels that it changed their lives forever and their style of reporting. And we all felt very, very committed. Same thing, and that's why I want to drive Syria home right now, is it's a slow motion genocide. Very similar to Sarajevo, that we were calling out, must be stopped. The world must pay attention to it. Now, I live in Paris, and, and coming to America for the past two weeks on this book tour, I'm really amazed by how little attention it's getting. Um, that, you know, it's, it's, there is, there are people being slaughtered. In, in Aleppo last week, the hospital where I work, Al-Quds Hospital, the only pediatrician was killed. Um, the, the first responders, the white helmets, were the, incre the bravest people in the world. We're not the bravest people in the world, they are. They go out and dig people out of the rubble. Five of them were killed. The gynecologist who delivers the babies was killed in Aleppo. Is it getting more play in Paris than it's getting here? Yes. I, I, well, I think Europe traditionally there's more interest in, in for, well, this is an election year for America, right. and I do understand that. But I also think Syria seems so remote, but so did Bosnia, and then there was a genocide of 8,000 men and boys, and we said it would never happen again, and it, and it, it, it is, is happening. I'm going to go back to some of the atrocities because Janine's book is it's just harrowing, and just like she said, she spends a lot of time with. 
different people and you kind of can't indelible images of really horrible things that, that happen. But back to the question, Kristen, if you would pick it up about do, do women bring something to correspondence, especially in war zones, that you wouldn't get it otherwise? You know, there's been lots of talk about women are different at the peacemaking table. Are they different or do they bring something? Is there a reason we need diversity in in the war correspondence? Yeah, I think women and men report quite differently um, on war. I think that male war reporters tend to focus much more on the actual fighting, the bang bang, if you like. Um, I've covered war for 28 years, but I, I can tell the difference between incoming and outgoing, fortunately. <laughs> but I can't really tell you very well what kind of weapons are being fired, well, where. What I focus on are the people behind the lines, the people that are living the war. Because actually, when you see war on TV, when you see Syria or places on TV, it looks like you know everything is fighting. When you actually go to the countries, there are millions of people still living their lives, trying to educate their children, trying to feed them and protect them. And those generally tend to be the women. So I do think that women focus on that more. And I've spent most of my career in the Middle East and in a lot of those countries. It's impossible for male reporters to go into women's quarters, so actually I'm getting access to both sides in a way that a lot of my male colleagues are not. My, my husband, Kevin Sullivan, spent a lot of time in war countries, and he was just saying, in some places, even the coffee shop, only the women are on one side and the men on the other, and of course he, he felt cut off from a lot of the women. So it's clearly an upside, especially in Muslim countries, to have women reporters there. What are the downsides? Are there downsides, Kim? Um, you know, it's I, this question, you get this question all the time, I've never reported as a man, so it's difficult for me to sort of... <laughs> <laughs> I feel it's, it's um, But, you know, I mean, sure, it's like, there are downsides because, it, it, you know, I think with, with a personal life and you're living over there, you've got to be really careful with what you're doing, you know, and there's been like books written like emergency sex and all this stuff. Uh, Noreen wanted me to talk about sex over there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, and you really couldn't live like that as a woman because you had to be really careful. I know about, there's a follow up, but there's yeah. C-SPAN, so I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> emergency part of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's a book. It's, it, it's a book. It has nothing to do with like anything oh, I else. Was something we no, 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 it's nothing actually. <laughs> don't have to worry about it. It's a book that came out that wrote a lot about this. But no, what I was saying is a woman over there, you had to be really protective of your reputation in a way I don't think male journalists had to. You know, you always had to be careful who you were going out with, what time you were coming home, because you were working with Afghans a lot of the times, and you had to make sure that they wanted to protect you. And so therefore, I felt like you almost had this obligation to, to repeat the idea of being this Western, loose woman, right? And that would come up a lot of times. I mean, it came up in Pakistan, it came up in India, it came up in Afghanistan. It comes up for all of us where, you know, you're, you think you're just being friendly to people, and then you start getting phone calls in the middle of the night, and you can't turn your phone off because your editors might call, and, you know, they're calling during Ramadan, it's four in the morning, and it's like, I love you. And, <laughs> So it was, it's irritations like that, it's irritations of being grabbed in public, of, you know, um, you know I, I, I write a lot about the fact that, I mean, I'm tall, I'm five foot ten, and I did punch out a lot of guys because I just got so irritated, and I would just start punching them, and that was dangerous, you know, obviously, like, my, my fixer didn't necessarily like that because he was the guy that would get in trouble for that. And I found that, you know, the grabbing happened equally in India and Pakistan, so I don't like it when people How did they religion. react to the punch? They didn't like it. And then they just ran away. That was like, I was like, and then there was like all this stuff with like, you know, um, it's funny because it's like I write about Nawaz Sharif in the book, you know, he's the current prime minister of Pakistan buying me an iPhone, and I think all of us have had similar experiences. And after the book came out, I'd have like this guy on Twitter who's like, you know, this is really unprofessional, Kim, because all of that hitting on the other stuff is probably off the record. Off the record. <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to be off the record when you're hitting on 
summer. <laughs> <laughs> That's on the record. And I also felt like it really, you know, writing about that sort of stuff shows the um, level of, uh, you know, I'm going to pretend to be this sort of um, very religious man in, in public, but then behind the scenes, I think this is okay to behave, behave this way with women. It does change when you have children. That's, that's the moment. I mean, everybody always says um, the difference between men and women. I've always resented when when they try to say women cover orphanages and hospitals and men cover war, because I've done a lot of frontline stuff too. I'm not interested in guns, but I, I have done a lot of military work. Um, but the moment that really changes for me personally was when I had a child. Mm -hmm. And that just, that drew the line completely because I know my male colleagues have children and some of them used to say, now, now you're entering the club where you're going to read bedtime stories by satellite phone. But I do think, and I'll go, uh, this is a risk saying this, that, that for women it's very different because we, we carry the child, we give birth, and there was this kind of extraordinary bond. And I'll never forget when my son was six months old, my old paper, The Times, um, which is not the most sensitive paper in the world to women, um, my editor deliberately sent me back to Iraq where I had been living for about two years covering Saddam and the invasion and the war. And um, I was still breastfeeding and I didn't want to go and I begged them not to send me but they used a clause on my contract mm -hmm. to send me and they said, um, we've got a war reporter that won't go to war. And I said, it's, it, there's nowhere that says I'm a war reporter, I'm a correspondent, I'm a senior foreign correspondent. I'm not a war reporter, send me to Paris or Brussels or something. <laughs> and I went and um, my foreign desk was like quite a macho little scene and the guy who was running the office um, said to me, he wanted me to go out and do something incredibly dangerous the first day I got there and it would have amounted to about two lines in a story that was being fed in from Washington and I said no. And I heard him on the phone cackling to um, some of his friends going, Di Giovanni lost her nerve now that she had a baby. Oh. And it was it was so awful, but it really, I thought, um, and I remember getting on the phone and calling my husband and crying and crying, and he said, but that's a good thing. Isn't it a good thing that you lost your nerve and that you're afraid? You're supposed to be afraid. <laughs> you, know, you can't be the last person in, in the middle of bombs flying. You've got to kind of feel like a human so being. Just to be more but it was so hard. after you had your baby, what changed? Did you stop doing certain things? I, I think for me, it was very personal because I very much felt suddenly, um, before that, I, I worked in Africa for years and years and years, and I was very happy to embed with militias in Sierra Leone or the Ivory Coast and, and spend months and months and months putting myself at, at great risk. And um, I suddenly got afraid. Like, in a normal way, I didn't want to get um, but you, injured. But you've just been in Syria several times, so... I know, it's a really conflicting thing, because as he got older, I realized that my... And this sounds very selfish, and some people might think I'm irresponsible, and I would not be able to argue with you about that. I mean, I feel that what I do is much more of a, um, a calling, in a sense. And I really believe in what I do, and I think it's hugely important that there are reporters that bear witness to atrocities and human rights violations. And without us and without our eyes and ears on the ground, we don't get a view, a window into what's happening. Do you know what's happening in Aleppo right now? You know, you don't. And I, I, I just felt that in some way I had to make this breach. And it's been really hard. I can't say it's been easy. And it's by story by story. Christina, why don't you pick that up? Because that happens to you all the time. All of us, right? You, you balance work and life. But if you're, you know, it's one thing to balance work, life, family balance when you're an insurance person in Pittsburgh. But if you're trying to manage risk and going to just about the world's most dangerous places, which all of you have been repeatedly, how do you balance? Is this story worth it? You have a son too, and a family. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very difficult. It's, um, I think, I, obviously, once you're responsible for a child, if you're a mother, you have to think about that first. Um, and so I don't go to places where I know that I'm going to be in crazy risk. And I think one of the things you learn about this job is actually the most dangerous things that have ever happened to me, being ambushed or being in suicide bombs, have often been in places which weren't supposed to be dangerous. So it's actually very difficult to, to plan this um, and 
look, we see these days you can be blown up in Brussels, in Paris, in um, anywhere. So, you know, it is, I think, difficult sort of balance. But I definitely, since I've become a mother, which is 16 years now, I um, am much more careful of where I go. And I think you also you feel a bit differently because you meet mothers and who are going through terrible things, whose children are being um, attacked, and you can identify with them much more than when you weren't a mother. So, and it's very hard sometimes to um, live with that. And yesterday was Mother's Day, and I tweeted, you know, this is for all the mothers in war zones, you know, that, that, that are trying to keep their families together, because they're so impressive, women trying to, to raise children in, in the middle of war. Uh, friends at the State Department are all Skyping from very dangerous places yesterday, their friends. So, Ms. Expendable, how do you feel about <laughs> that? <laughs> I was a chicken. I mean, I, I, I didn't need to have a kid to value my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, change if you have children, if your life's not important before that. Um, you know, and like, how, I, how important is your life? Not <laughs> 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 the most important thing to me. Um, you know, and like I have parents, and I also, more importantly, had a fixer and a driver. And you know, for me, after what happened to uh, Chwal Makhshwandi in Afghanistan, when he was when his head was cut off, um, after they were cut, kidnapped him and an Italian journalist were kidnapped by the Taliban, and um, the, the journalist was released and, and left Ajmal behind, and Ajmal was killed. I was like, yeah, we don't need to do those things if you feel like they're dangerous, Farouk. And there's no story. I, I, I wasn't the sort of person who's like, oh, I'm going to go out in the middle of um, the countryside and meet the Taliban. And those reporters are great. They're probably better reporters than I am. I was happy to go to jail and meet the Taliban who had just been arrested. Because <laughs> <laughs> they had been arrested. And I was happy to have them come to meet me inside cities and hotels, you know, because there was like a string of times where, you know, friends might be like, I'm going to go meet the Taliban. I'm like, and you're going to get kidnapped. <laughs> and it would happen. I mean, it is this case by case thing that we all have to deal with. And, mm -hmm. it's, and that's a good point. And, and if the story is the same, when you can talk to somebody in the United States, it's very different. But if you want to be eyewitnesses, Janine's going to talk about them in a minute. Sometimes you can't go to jail. Yeah, I, mean, I, know, I know. But I, know. I, know. But I want that. But I, I think what's jail. interesting is that for all of you, different things triggered why you went there. Then you got there and you got hooked. And I just want to read a, a, a passage from Christina's book that uh, is towards the end of her book. Uh, she, she, it's called War Never Leads You. And November 2014, in the, of course, in the end, I went back. I missed Afghanistan with the yearning that I could not explain. I had an adorable clapboard house in Washington with a rocking chair on the porch and a white picket fence where every day a yellow school bus came to collect my son just like in the American movies. And I had a great job and wonderful friends. Yet part of me was somewhere else entirely, dreaming of pomegranate pips, shining red rubies. If I drove through Rock Creek Park with my roof down, the scent of the pines reminded me of the mountains in Paktia. In my big American house, I had a walk-in wardrobe, its shelves piled with silk scarves in bright colors like magenta pink and peacock blue, each one with a memory. Um, and you went on from there about how you had to go back because it was just always in your senses. You missed sitting on the village floors drinking green tea and listening to fantastical stories <coughs> of ancient feuds. I never remembered the bad bits. So is it that you like childhood? Right? So is it like childhood? Child. <laughs> you just kind of okay, I mean a lot of bad things happened. You lost friends, colleagues, people you knew, and yet you kept going back. I think when you keep going to the same place over and over again, it's not a story. It, it, you know the people there, you don't think of it as an issue or it, it, it's you think about all the people that you know there and what's happening to them and what people to know about it. I mean, one of the things I feel very angry about at the moment is the way that people are sort of accepting that 
for our politicians that the war in Afghanistan is over because we declared it over a couple of years ago. In fact, more people were killed in Afghanistan than any year of the war. And what makes me most angry is the situation of the women there, because you remember that when the Taliban were toppled, the discussion was, now we're going to make women free. And Laura Bush and Sherry Blair and people gave um, radio addresses and talked about it. Actually, we encouraged women in Afghanistan to do all sorts of things they would never have otherwise done, run for office, become security um, guards, doing all sorts of things, which is good. But now we've just left those people behind and we're not protecting them. And they stood up and have done things that were not traditional in their culture and now they're being targeted and we're not there to help them. And I, actually, I think we have a moral responsibility to do something about that. So I feel really passionately that we shouldn't forget that. And once you're so deep in a story, you feel a responsibility to let the world know. So in Janine's book, she, she writes these indelible images of things, and I was touched by this one passage in, in Janine's book. When my son was born shortly after the American occupation of Iraq, I was unable to cut his nails. It was visceral rather than rational reaction. I would pick up the tiny baby scissors and look at his translucent fingers, clean and pink as seashells, and feel as though I would wretch. I had a vision of an Iraqi man I knew who had no fingernails. And then it goes on at length about this man who used to come into your office in Iraq who had been tortured and all his fingernails taken off and, and how every time you saw your baby. And it's incredible. Uh, it, and uh, you, like you started to say, you met these people, stayed close to them, and wrote horrific things. So what draws you, um, I mean, Syria right now is just about the most dangerous place on Earth. We've all lost friends there. Are, are you going to go back, Jenny? Well, I feel very committed to it. Um, and I also feel that last week after Al Quds Hospital was bombed, the, the attacks on medical workers, um, I find absolutely horrific. Um, and so I, I feel the need, and it's not a pull, it's interesting because I do have friends who I would say are addicted to war, and they clearly are addicted, they like the adrenaline, they like the fact that they're taken out of their ordinary, um, boring day-to-day -day lives where we have to pay bills and drive kids to school, and they go into a war zone where you very much live in the moment because you're trying to stay alive. But I don't think I was ever like that. Um, I think for me it was much more about um, something Martha Galborn said many years ago, which was, um, you have one war that you fall in love with, the rest is responsibility. And I think, again, Bosnia did that to me, and, and now Syria, I've fallen in love again. Um, and I do feel very committed to it in the way that the people I've spent so much time with. And a lot of what I do is I write about um, human rights violations, so rape and torture, which is very hard to report. And the only way you could do it is by spending huge amounts of time with people and gaining their trust. You can't just fly in, you know, get a quick story and, and get out. You need to sit on the floor with them for weeks. Sometimes I've spent months in, in Kosovo working with just one village of women, an entire village that had been raped. Um, and I worked actually with Human Rights Watch, so it was, um, we did a very kind of quantitative research and gathering data. Um, and it's heartbreaking. It's, I once learned in a first aid class that if someone ever gets hit by a shrapnel, um, you can't pull the, the piece of whatever it is out of their body because they'll bleed to death. You have to staunch it and sustain it. And I feel often when I'm interviewing someone who's been deeply, deeply traumatized, um, you can't just go in and pull things out of them. You just have to sit and you wait and you listen and gradually the story emerges, or it might not. They might not want to talk to you. Um, I, I'm just saying this story that we wrote about the girls in Cleveland who had been held in the basement for 10 years. It took a year before yeah. we had this one and start talking. You just need patience. Too. So, we're, I'm sorry, we're going to go to the audience for some questions, and then I, I do want to, if anybody has questions, they can raise their hand and we have a mic. Uh, there, and don't give someone here in the front. Good evening. Um, you mentioned earlier, Janine and others, are very 
enjoy the reaction to your stories and the change that it could affect or not. In Bosnia, if you took Shravenica before, it forced the world to act. And has there been, is that what it takes, a huge incident like that? Or is the reporting being just ignored until that moment occurs? Let's talk about the consequences intended or not of reporting. It's a good question. <coughs> Either intended or not. Let's talk about humanitarian intervention. I mean, we lived in Bosnia and Rwanda were more the times of humanitarian intervention, and it was much more a time of empathy and compassion. I, mean, I think we, we have a very different administration right now. But, um, and I think most of us do write to affect policy in some way. I mean, that, that's our role, essentially, is to shine a light in the darkest corners. But whether or not we can do it, whether or not we can reach policymakers, is, is kind of beyond, beyond us. But ultimately, that's our goal, to get resolutions made and international law to be honored and transitional justice to happen and accountability. And that's the main thing I work for. I don't want these guys that rape and torture and kill and murder to go to have impunity. I want them to pay. I want them to end up in in seeking or getting um, justice served to them. So I think that's the real and reason. And it's not always it's geared towards policymakers, but like in Vietnam, which is a classic example, it was geared towards telling the public what was happening on the ground. But an enormous role that more corresponds have is to let, you know, even if Capitol Hill or policymakers aren't listening, but the public is. I mean, you shouldn't take a show and eat, so should it really? But I think one of the problems now is we've had so many wars over the last few years in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. People are a bit inured to all of this. You know, it's difficult to actually shock people anymore. Or, and I think people are tired of it all and um, you know, wish it would all go away. Frankly, Afghanistan in, in the UK gets almost no coverage now because I think people or newspapers are battling because there's so many wars going on. Um, and it's also become much more dangerous to cover them. I mean, that, there's two big changes since I started out. One is the technology, which has made it a lot easier so that we can file from stories from the top of a mountain or the middle of a desert. When I started out, um, Afghanistan didn't even have a telephone system, so I was going into Afghanistan for weeks and only being able to call back my stories when I went back to Pakistan. Even then, there was no direct dialing. There was telex, if you remember that. Or I was dictating to copy takers in London, which is quite a difficult thing to do because you're um, dictating a long story and you've got someone at the other end saying to you, is there much more of this? <laughs> <laughs> so that side's become a lot easier, the technology. Um, the, other side has become much harder is that we it's become much more dangerous. We've become targets in a way we weren't when I started out. Um, we find it very frustrating that there are places that we can't go to and report from because it's been become so dangerous. And that is something I never thought I would say 10 or 20 years ago that I just can't go there because it's too dangerous. Also, that the nature of the news business has changed so much, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, you know, as we've been going through these wars, and there's just so much information out there. And it's not like people feel like they have to read the entire Washington Post or the New York Times or the Sunday Times to get their news. They pick and choose what they want to read. So, a lot of times, you even have stories that are out there. You know, I remember when there was a controversy over there were bombings on days in like Europe and in Pakistan at the same time, and there was people complaining that. You know, no one was covering the Pakistani bomb bombings the same way they were covering the ones in Europe. Um, and it turns out, like, somebody studied readership of the stories that were actually done, and nobody read those stories that were done about the bombings in Pakistan. Because people don't care, you know? And that's, I think, the biggest challenge that we face right now, is that everybody only wants to read stories that reinforce and force their own political beliefs, and that cover areas that interest them. And the way newspapers used to be, and we're never going to go back there, is you would read everything, you know? Mm. Except for the woman in the front row who reads everything. <laughs> <laughs> So 
to repeat what I was saying or? Okay. Um, I'm a writer and editor, and I actually lived in Syria from 2009 to 2011. And I was interested, uh, and I visited Bosnia as well, and I was interested if you could talk a little bit more about the public's reaction to what was going on in Bosnia at the time, and if you see the reaction now more as uh, a product of sort of latent orientalism or latent uh, racism, um, and if this, or if this was a, a matter more of geographic distance and you know, that kind of separation, and then equally what Syria can learn from post war Bosnia, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it post-peace Bosnia, but in looking ahead to a transition state, what kind of lessons can you learn from that? The two really, really good questions. Um, okay, I'll try. The first one, when I was reporting, Sarajevo, I worked for the Sunday Times, which um, at that point, I was battling um, against Princess Diana and Prince Charles to get in the paper. <laughs> Seriously, and I had this horrible foreign editor who like took, a, you know, just, he, he just said, people are bored by this, people are bored by this. And it came to one point where, do you remember Romeo and Juliet in Bosnia, the couple, a Muslim and a Serb, who ran away to get married and were killed on a bridge. And he wasn't interested because Princess Diana had done something and didn't run the story. And then, of course, it became the icon of, of Sarajevo. So it was a real struggle, and it was very frustrating. But I think we just felt like we're going to keep going. We're going to keep pushing it. And what I would do is <laughs> they would send me from London and they'd say, you're going to go for six weeks. And I wouldn't come home. And I, in those days, there weren't cell phones. <laughs> so they couldn't find me. And I would just disappear <laughs> and go off and investigate it, go towards Bocha and investigate the rape camps. But it was hugely frustrating. Um, your question about racism is so interesting because while Bosnia was happening, and we, were, we felt that we were being ignored, even though Sarajevo, if there were flights, was only three hours from London by plane, the Rwandan genocide was breaking out in 1994. By the time my foreign desk sent me there, it was May. It had started in April. And I think that one of the reasons that, there was, that, that it was not, not only covered properly, but that the genocide was allowed to continue was because there were so few journalists there who could then get there. I think that had they been there, I don't think a million people would have been killed. I think in some way it could have been halted. Lessons learned. Um, we should talk after the event because I have a whole, I just wrote a thesis for the Fletcher School about the lessons learned from Bosnia onto the Syrian war. I mean, mainly, let's hope and pray they don't partition Syria because we see what a disaster Bosnia is now. 25 years after Dayton, it stopped the killing, but it, it, it's contributed to the rise of nationalism, sectarianism that never existed before, and I don't want to see that happen to Syria. But we can talk. Yeah. I guess my question is, um, how do you get to see in a war what you want to see? Because the fact is that there was just a bunch of reporters in Assyria on like a government yeah. uh, tour, and it wasn't dangerous for them at all, but I guess, like, how do you get to see both sides in a war um, without subjecting yourself to like huge personal risk. I think you, know, you're only ever seeing a fragment of what's going on. You can't ever see the war in general. Um, like I was saying, in Afghanistan years ago, when you went for weeks and weeks, when you came back to write a story, you were pretty well informed then. These days, because of technology, we're expected to write immediately and report. And so you can only really genuinely report on where you are at that particular time. You don't know what's going on elsewhere. And in fact, during the war in Iraq, when I came back, I was in southern Iraq and then went to Baghdad. And I felt like I'd missed some of the war by being there because everyone had watched it at home and seen all these things on TV and were talking about all this <laughs> stuff and I didn't know anything about it. So, um, and I think, you know, it's dangerous when journalists on the spot try and generalize about places when actually they really <coughs> can't see much more than what they're seeing. There's a big debate about sort of embedding with troops and, you know, whether that's the right thing to do. And I used to be against doing that because I thought you should go as an independent and the war in Iraq, I was there as what we would call unilaterals where you weren't attached to anybody. But actually, you know, that, reporting on your country's troops and what they're doing is part of the story. And I think the important thing is to try and do both sides. Same with Syria, if you can go 
with the regime and see what they're showing, but you can also go independently um, into rebel-held areas or other areas, um, then you're getting a much more balanced picture. It's difficult to do that. Often countries don't let you go in if, if they know that you've reported with the, the fighters. You can't really think about it there. You were there yeah, I, I embedded. Um, I mean, I feel the same way that Christina did, I, or does uh, now. But I always like I hadn't done the unilateral stuff before, and I didn't go under in any embeds. I think I went on maybe six to eight, something like that, over the five years I, I lived over there. Um, How long were you with them each time? I mean, a week or two. But you know, I found like you know, I, I realized pretty quickly when I went out on one embed. And this guy said to me, um, you know, at night, be sure to take your photographer with you. Photographers, by the way, love it when you say your photographer, um, because it implies like they're your pet. Um, but so they say, you know, be sure to take your photographer with you when you go to the bathroom at night, because there are only three women on the base. And I just, you know, I said, well, you're not going to send me anywhere, are you? If you think that I'm going to face an issue on the base going to the bathroom at night. And I found a lot of times, and I talked to a lot of folks in the military about this, like, when I would hang around them longer, do you send women out on the more dangerous, like, missions? Would you send me out to Korenthal, which was the most dangerous area at that point? Um, and they just sort of said, you know, we might send you there, but we wouldn't send you on the more dangerous patrols. Because we worry that, you know, and it's largely men uh, who are in the military will want to protect you as opposed to, like, you know, the male reporters or photographers. They sort of feel like, you know, they're, it's, it's up to them if they're going to go. Um, so I can see his point. So I, I think that, like, when I went out on embeds, I got stories of these guys who would tell me about broken marriages, about the fact that they hadn't seen their kids in so long, um, about what, more like what it was like to have these constant deployments. And then, of course, I wrote a story that after the story um, where guys kept telling me that they were not locked and loaded, um, you know, they ended up getting moved to another more dangerous place because of what they had told me. And, um, you know, the main guy in my story uh, ended up, like, getting uh, blown up in an IED explosion and losing his leg. And uh, I didn't find that out until after I came back. And I wonder if I'd known about that when I was over there, if it would have made me pull my punches more on embeds, because I think that is a danger when you're on an embed that you're going to do stories that you want the troops to like, because you're with them so much. And so when I was there, I always tried to make sure that I just am going to do the story that I see here. I'm not going to worry about whether anybody likes me afterwards. And um, I can't deny that when I found that out after I came back, that I felt really horrible, obviously, even though, you know. So what do you do about that? The, you know, the consequences of reporting. Um, I mean, how do you deal Can with I that? Can I talk about, because I think you were asking particularly about Syria, which um, Damascus, I mean, to get visas to the regime side, which the New York Times just did, it's it's actually, to be honest, I've, in, initially in the beginning of the war, I got five or six. It's really paranoid making. Um, it's not dangerous the way it is to go on the other side through Turkey or through Lebanon with the opposition, but you are incredibly paranoid. And um, when you're when you're with government minders or um, especially Syria, whenever you work in a regime, or I was just in Iran, or even I was in Egypt last week, there's a different kind of danger, and that is that you're going to be taken away and put in prison, mm -hmm. and or, or killed in a place where security services have absolutely no qualms about taking foreigners, like the Italian student who was just killed in Egypt, and killing you, you do, you, you're not in danger of bombs and sniping, but it's quite spooky. I mean, I've been probably the most spooked I've been in a long time in Damascus, knowing that I was being bugged and followed and every email was being read. It's very unnerving. Janine does a smart thing, I thought a very clever part of the book, when, when she talks about taking a $100 taxi ride from Beirut to Damascus, kind of just to set it in the reader's mind that it is pretty close, and yet you cross the border and everything changes and it gets pretty dangerous pretty quickly and it's right there in the center. Of the Different area. kind of danger. And I, I think all three of these books, I mean it is amazing where Christina talks about all these people that are in the news, you know, Christina basically interviewed every single one of them as all of you guys have, and they have this wonderful personal touch um, and you know the way you describe things and also to put yourself in. Kim, 
Kim's genius, you know, she's talking about boyfriends calling, and she's like, you know, I'd rather go to that guest. What was I thinking? I'd rather go to that guest. I was wondering, you didn't name that guy, but how did he take that? Oh, yeah. I mean, that guy, the guy... Did you name him? Paul Lester? I didn't put his last name. I gave him no Oh, he was, I mean, like, we're still friends. <laughs> I mean, I, I got buy-in from everybody who was in the book. They got what I was doing. I'm supposed to come off unlikable at point, points, and I'm supposed to be the foil for America going into this country that it knew nothing about. I'm supposed to come off as naive and arrogant, and just like America does. And, you know, Farouk is supposed to be Afghanistan, who's like in it in the beginning, but at a certain point gets a sense that I'm going to leave, and so he's going to get as much money as he can. You know, who can blame him? Kim, you, uh, you brought up Joseph Heller before, um, and there's a scene in Catch-22 when the pilots are talking to each other, and one of them says, I want to have a, a long life, and the other one asks, why? And the answer is, well, what else is there? Uh, I imagine that the three of you know full well what else is there, that, that there's no guarantee for a long life. So for the three of you, whether for that, for that risk, or for, frankly, the apathy of your readers your ed or, your, or your editors, have you ever thought about stopping? Have you ever thought about, no, this isn't worth it anymore, that there's something else to do, or no, and you just kept going, thanks. I mean, I stopped. <laughs> I might go back. I mean, I could see going back, and I feel like every day I make the choice to stay here, and it's a difficult choice to make, because I miss being in Afghanistan, I miss being in Pakistan, I miss living in the middle of a story and having conversations at night that are about the future of countries. And feeling like you're actually seeing a country change and watching a democracy get built. I miss that feeling. Um, but, you know, I decided to see if I could live normal. I mean, as normal as any journalist is. And I, I'm a metro reporter now in New York, you know? Um, then that's what I do. And we'll see how long that lasts, but for right now, it's working. I think the problem is that the, the wars don't end. One of the sort of arguments in my book is we don't know how to end wars anymore. I wish Afghanistan would end so I could kind of go there on holiday with my son. I wish Libya and Iraq and the other places if I got would end. Um, you asked if I'd ever thought of stopping. Well, when I had my son in 99, I did think I was going to stop doing what I was doing. I, I write books, other kind of books, as well as this war. <laughs> And I, so I thought I would stop. I had six months off from my newspaper to research a book. And um, my husband's Portuguese, and we moved to Portugal the day before September 11th for me to start writing this book. And um, the first day that I started writing, September 11th, I got a phone call. And I often wonder, if it hadn't been Afghanistan where Bin Laden was, would I have gone back if it had been Iraq or somewhere which I didn't have the same kind of background of in? But Afghanistan, because it was my first story and I cared so much about, it was almost like sort of your first love affair, I think. And um, there was no way I wasn't going to go back. And also, I'd been angry that people had forgotten about it after the Russians left. So there was no, no thought of not doing it. Um, I, I think about stopping every day um, and, and what else I could do. And one thing I did do is in 2014, I went to work for the UN for a year because I've spent my entire career criticizing and going after the UN and taking them to pieces. And I just thought I wanted to work for the UN Refugee Agency, which is probably of all of them the best, um, the best of the lot, on the Syria crisis. I wanted to see from that perspective, and I also wanted to gain more insight into going deeper with research. And the year after that, I was given a fellowship from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy to do um, another degree in international law. And I did that because I just feel like if I'm going to spend my life researching human rights, I really need to have a basis in law in which I have gained from the field, but I need it to go deeper. And uh, I just graduated in March, and I, um, and I think all the time, you know, can I go work for a bank now? Can I go, um, can I go work for Morgan Stanley? Can I go work for the British government, the French government, the State Department? I, I am no way addicted to, to being in the field, but I do feel that um, we have skills 
that you know we've gained over the years that are important and they're also they're vital and um, I think that we we have something that we need to contribute. Um, at the same time, we need to stay alive. And after I was in Grozny when it fell to Russian forces in 2000, it was the most the closest I've ever come to dying. And my husband at the time said to me. Um, the best journalist is the one who gets out alive to tell the story. And it's true, we're, we're worth absolutely nothing if we get killed or if we're maimed. So um, it's, it's that constant, um, we're not insane, we're not crazy. We, we have a role and I think we do it well. Um, and I think that, you know, Martha Gellman did it till she was well into her 90s. Um, I don't want to get into my 90s doing it, but I think that, you know, we, we have something we do that's quite normal. Can I just say something about it, yeah, that I think, I mean, Janine and I are making it sound like it's all misery, and um, um, actually, you know, you have fun, too, um, and that's what Kim um, really describes so well, but you wouldn't keep going to these places if all it was was relentless misery. A week ago, I was at the most wonderful Kurdish wedding on the border between Turkey and Syria. All those people that had fled Syria had terrible stories, didn't know when they would see their home again. But they had fun that night. They really made a lot of effort to enjoy the wedding, to show their children the Kurdish dancing, music, and you know, you could forget just for a few hours the misery of what was happening to their home, just you know, less than an hour's drive away. And I think one of the weirdest things that ever happened to me, which brought this home to me, after Benazir was killed in Pakistan, she was a good friend of mine, and I thought, how is Pakistan going to survive this? And there was kind of riots in her home province of Sin, and people talked about Pakistan breaking up and all of this sort of apocalyptic stuff. And um, I arrived at the airport and got taxi driver, and journalists notoriously always ask the taxi driver what's going on. <laughs> and, and, and he said, oh, it's very grim, everything's very bad. So I said, yeah, you know, Venice is death and everything. And he said to me, no, we have no discos. <laughs> and he said to me, we don't have any discos in Pakistan. <laughs> you know, I, I was 14 years old. It's so true what they say, it's all about high highs and low lows. And when you come back after all these high highs, you kind of forget the low lows. And, and for you guys, and, and even myself, we've lost colleagues and, and, and gotten killed. I mean, the lows are low, but the highs are super high. And then at some point you come back and you're kind of, kind of happy to, to just do the middle. But it's never like it is when you're Mary, that is perfectly linked to my question because I wanted to talk about that. I mean, Christina and Kim, they really speak to the value of camaraderie. I notice that every answer to every question you reference, you reference others. I mean, other people, people you met, people at the wedding, and as photographers. Talk a little bit about the value of solidarity when it comes to these conflicts, and particularly among women, because you two really exemplify that camaraderie and, and that sisters in arms mentality that I think exists when one works overseas. Thank you. Um, I think it's really important because there are still very few of us women in the field doing this kind of work. And so I think it is very important we stick up for each other and that we um, that there is solidarity between us. And um, I was a bit surprised by Janine saying in the beginning that she didn't find that because I so have always found Early on, I'm talking about way back in the late 80s, yeah. was And I think, you know, the most upsetting thing as a woman correspondent, as a mother, is when other women attack you for what you do because it isn't easy. But there are, I mean, I mentor young women all the time now because I wasn't mentored because there weren't older women that supported me. My, you know, in now I, I have interns all the time, I have young women, I try to to make them, um, you know, I would never say to someone, all the time young people say to me, is it worth becoming a journalist? I say, yes, absolutely. It's the greatest job in the world. So I do, I do think they're solitary, absolutely. It's funny because people watch the movie 
you know, and friends of mine before the movie was coming out, they're saying, hey, is that, um, is that Tanya Vanderpool, Mar 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 Margot Robbie's character, is that based on me? And I said, no, because you're not that pretty. <laughs> also, you're nice. Um, you know, and because it's like, we just had this group of people, and some of them were in the audience, actually, who all just helped each other, and, you know, we would always make sure that everybody was taken care of, you talk about stories. I just felt no sort of, I, I mean, I would have done anything, and I'd still do anything to help the, you know, female reporters that I would work with over there. And what's nice is, like, when you have that, you're sort of in this, you're, you're sort of, you can call it the kabubble, you can call it whatever, but you're in this sort of zone where you, you, you will be friends for life, and you know we didn't even we barely met each other over there. But like I think that we like we got all the similar sort of. She was saying answers, and I'm like that's what I usually say. You know? <laughs> but also between different news organizations, in yeah. dangerous places, people really do bond together, and it's a great question about solidarity because when you're out there, uh, you you do you know the way normally, and then especially in this town, there's a lot of competition. It, in many ways, it disappears. Well, I have to say working. Christina in the United States when she was here as the DC Bureau Chief for the Sunday Times. She was really one of the most collegial and sharing reporters that I've ever worked with. Carmen. All right, we have one last question and then we can stay and talk. Well, thank you. I'm not entirely sure how to ask this question, but I want to follow up on a couple of points that you made. You, so why, why are we not paying more attention to what's going on in Aleppo? And you said that we're really in Europe to so much of this conflict now that it just kind of rolls off of us, and, and it really kind of does. And one of the reasons I was really looking forward to that, I think collectively, your experiences are amazing, and they are. But, you know, for those of us that are trying to, to keep up, there are so many different players, and there are so many different conflicts, and all, and then the, the, the external players, Russia, the United States, Europe, Saudi Arabia, it all seems pretty hopeless. And, and so I'm just curious, I mean, you know, you said the highs and the highs and the lows and the lows. You know, where is there hope for, for all of this to, to somehow or other get sorted out? Or, or what is your sense of this? It, it is, it's incredibly complicated. We don't feel um, ignorant because, I mean, I literally have to, and I've studied the Middle East for 25 years, you know, to sit down and draw graphs and put markers and try to put things on maps and identify who's fighting who. There's a thousand militias fighting on the opposition, on the Syrian position right now. Um, and that's not even taking into the, the, the international players, Russia, um, Russia, Qatar, Saudi, Iran, um, Turkey, Egypt, it goes on and on, the US. Um, all I could say is that you know, wars do end, they eventually do end when, when the battle, when the players on the battlefield become exhausted. And at this stage now, it's, it's gearing up. I mean, I don't think Syria is going to go into a 17-year war like Lebanon. I do think that it will eventually come to a head in one way or another. I just wish it would be sooner rather than later, and we don't have to wait for it to be 400,000 people dead, because that's what your question earlier about Shrevenica. In 1992, we started calling out for it, and, and we had to wait until the end of 1995 when 8,000 men and boys were killed. So I don't think we want to wait until there's a genocide. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, you know, President Obama made a decision, a very tactical decision in 2013, that um, he did not want to get engaged in a third Middle Eastern war um, because he was elected on, on a platform to get out of wars. And um, doing that policy of nonchalance has had a great cost, and that was the rise of ISIS. Um, they didn't come out of nowhere. Um, they've been around, and it's... You know, it's the result of the failure in, in Iraq, and it's the result of our own policy of, of not paying enough attention. Um, if, if I saw ISIS on the ground in 2012, why was everyone, why was the world so surprised when Mosul finally fell? So I think in some way we, we have to have accountability as well, because we, are, um, we allowed our compassion to become fatigued. And that's always a very, very dangerous thing for us to become complacent. And, I think that's why I write what I do, is I really want people to be upset. I want them to be shook up. It's not easy to read, but it's, it's the truth. And um, I think it's important that, that we digest it. A lot of these things, there is all short-term thinking and short-term decisions. We care about what's happening now. 
So actually, you can track ISIS back to the jihad in Afghanistan against the Russians when all our focus was defeating the Russians in the Cold War, and we didn't care how we did it. So we brought people from um, Arab countries who were criminals or gangsters or Salafists and encouraged them to come and fight because our only interest was defeating the Russians. And I think that's one of the things I find hardest in the job, that you keep seeing the same mistakes being made over and over again, and you kind of feel like, don't we ever learn? Look at Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, um, every single one. The easy thing is removing the regime. That's not difficult with our militaries, but what do you do then? And in each one, we haven't had a plan for what to do afterwards. So, um, but to, just to go back to your question, you know, it is really complicated and it's so complicated that we're on the same side as some countries in one place and on different sides to them in other places. But the reason I keep doing this is that the way you find hope is in the people. I'm endlessly amazed at how people in the midst of all these difficult situations still keep um, really focused on in particular trying to educate her children um, and I was lucky enough to work with Malala on her book and you know she is so inspiring she risked her life to be able to go to school and for the sake of other children to go to school and when you meet people like that and you can tell their story it makes it all worth it. Nice work. Well I mean I don't think I could do this job if I didn't feel hope. Right, even for Afghanistan, and I'll, I'll give an entire hour speech about how things are going horribly in Afghanistan. And somebody will say, well, then what, should we, shouldn't we just pull everybody home? And I, no, you've got the wrong point. I mean, I still, I feel like, you know, what you were saying is exactly the same sort of things. Like, we do have a chance there, and there have been improvements there. Just the very fact of having cell phone coverage now in Afghanistan, of having the internet there, of having TV stations like Tolo there that do reality TV shows where Afghan women now feel so empowered that they will do presentations, sing with their hair and rock out. I mean, this one woman on International Women's Day on, you know, Afghan Star, I watched her performance and I was like, you are the bravest feminist I've ever seen. So there are positive things happening there. And I think that you try to hold on to those. And the whole idea that if we just walk away now and we don't actually give the country stability enough for the next generation to take over would be the biggest mistake. And also, look, you know, it's today. We're looking around saying the world's falling apart, the world's falling apart. Look at 30 years ago, look at 60 years ago. You can go back to generations. World War II was no picnic. So, you know, we just happen to know more about it now because of the internet, because of all the news. Um, so I guess I would just say, you know, there is hope in every place you're looking at. Well, you know, it's a, it's a long, important, and complicated uh, discussion about where America and Britain and, and, and the Western world goes with Syria, what their obligations are, and, and Afghanistan and Pakistan. But tonight, I thought it was a very special night to talk to three women who, you know, kind of a look behind the news and the people. Uh, you guys have done an amazing job with these three books. And as Janine says, you're writing to shake things up. Their books shake things up, their stories. And I'm grateful that tonight you kind of helped us know who, the, who you are a little bit and kind of why you do what you do. And thank you. Thank you.